This is the Kenosis class number 23. We're going to be dealing with Jesus as the son of David. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Jesus as the son of David. A Luke 18, 35. That was close. Um, this is the story of blind Bartimaeus, <clears throat> Luke 18, 35, and it came to pass that as he was come near unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. <clears throat> and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David. Have mercy on me. And they who went ahead rebuked him that he should hold his peace, but he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him, and when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. <clears throat> Here's a, a very interesting little story uh, I've shared from these scriptures in the past but I don't want to really deal with what I've shared in the past on this <clears throat> but I want you to notice that this was a blind man and this is I think this is important to the story because he is not moved by what he sees <clears throat> because he doesn't see anything and so he has learned to get by without sight. <clears throat> and so there's a multitude passing by, and it says, uh, uh, and he asked, what does this mean? Because he can't see. What does this mean? And they said to him, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. In verse 38, but he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And then they who went ahead rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, and this time it's even more focused and more to the point. He doesn't say, Jesus, thou son of David. He says, thou son of David. Have mercy on me. He doesn't say Jesus. He, didn't, he never says Jesus of Nazareth. He doesn't say Jesus the second time. <clears throat> he simply says, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And <clears throat> Jesus stops the whole thing and asks him, What do you want? What is, what is your need? And he says, That I may see. And Jesus heals him and his eyes are open. Um, you know, over in Matthew chapter 15, if you'll turn there with me. <clears throat> Matthew 15 and starting in verse 21. <clears throat> Then Jesus went from there and departed into the borders of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan. All right, so what would you call this woman? A Canaanite woman. A woman of Cana came out of the same borders and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me. Sound familiar? Blind man? Um. Uh, foreigner who doesn't know anything hardly about Israel. But she cried unto him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. And the Lord helps her. 
And so there is this reality, there is this thing about Jesus being the son of David, and he's the son of David, which, which is not referring to, I mean, I'm trying to make you see something here. It's not calling him the son of God, that God is his father. It's saying D David is his father, and it's putting him as an earth being, an earth man, if you will, that has David as his father. And the blind man, the foreign woman, they may not know too much. They may not have seen too much. They may not know, you know, everything about all the customs and all of the, the rituals and everything like that. The blind man was a beggar. But they know something about the son of David that has moved them both. And the information that they have received has affected them so much so that they felt that they could cry out to this one as son of David and get some help. <clears throat> now, make a few statements here, and that is that nobody really knew God the Father or God. Nobody really knew God. They didn't know what he was like. They didn't know, you know, they thought they did because of stories and this and that and whatever, but they didn't really know what he was like. But they knew what David was like. So Jesus came in their minds to reach men as the son of David. Um, I want to show you that in the scriptures in several different places. Over in the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 1. In verse 18. No man, this is Jesus speaking. No man hath seen God at any time. The only, well, I guess it's, it may not be Jesus speaking here. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And I want you to notice that he didn't say the, the only begotten Son who is from heaven, he hath declared him, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, meaning much more than proximity in heaven. It means proximity to his heart. He really knows him. You understand what I'm saying? He's not sitting on a throne beside him watching what he's doing and therefore knows him. He's in the bosom of the Father. But he's saying nobody really knows the Father. <clears throat> and then, uh, let's see, let's go to Matthew again, Matthew 11. And... Uh, Verse 27, all things are delivered unto me by my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son, and he to whomever the Son will reveal him. And so <clears throat> Jesus is, is uh, about to well, ha has taken on this place of the son of David, and he's done it for a reason that is very important to mankind and for m making that bridge that they may know God through this man. <clears throat> and uh, um, let, me, let me just read a couple of statements here that I think would be very important. Well, before I read it, let me state this. The son of David, or David, is connected with the kingdom. Do you agree with that? I mean, that David is always connected with the kingdom. And so the true and full picture that we're going to get from David are his son. The son of David is we're 
going to find out something about the king or the kingdom through this one. More than we would anybody else. Through this one, we're going to find out about the kingdom. So, in his relation, speaking of David, in his relation with King Saul and others, David establishes a manner that does not demand official glory. From the very beginning, I mean, he's a kid. He's, what, 16 years old or, or thereabout. He's tending his father's sheep. He's the youngest among all of them. But he gets anointed king. And what does he do? What does he do with that? What would you do with that? <laughs> he goes back and starts taking care of his father's sheep. He does not demand official glory. Though he was also anointed as king, he did not contest with Saul for it. And I'll, we'll, we'll look at a few scriptures in just a minute uh, to prove that. He carries himself with humility. David's kingdom in the cave. And I, I want you to really consider that phrase, kingdom in a cave doesn't really sound right, does it? <laughs> a kingdom in a cave. David's kingdom in the cave and on the run established the first kingdom. And I'll, all this will be shown with the scriptures. Established the first kingdom, one of being governed by God's nature and living by the glory of nature with no official glory. It was the king whose conscience smote him when he cut off Paul, part of Saul's garment. It was, the king, it was the king within him that didn't strike the other guy who claimed to be king, and yet God said no to that and had announced him as king. He did not step up with official glory because he was a true king. And the true kingdom that he lived by at first, and we'll see all this, was a kingdom based on the glory of nature and not on official glory. So the first, that the, that's the first half of his kingdom. The second half of his kingdom was in resurrection. When he is given official glory. Right? Right? He's taken out of the caves. First he's put over Judah, and then he's put over all Israel. But first is one kingdom, and then another. But when lowered again, he easily took the place of the first kingdom. And, and there are too many examples I can give you to show that he still didn't demand official glory, even in resurrection. Okay? So, um, let me give you a few more scriptures here then in John chapter 10 in verse 15 and the Lord spoke this scripture to me sometime back and it's it's become a very precious verse to me <clears throat> John chapter 10 verse 15 Jesus is talking to his disciples and everybody and but he makes this statement <clears throat> as the father knoweth me even so I know the father And I lay down my life for the sheep. All right. So Jesus is talking, my sheep know my voice, da 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 da. He's talking about them, and he's, they're getting to know him, and he's getting to know them and everything. But all of a sudden he stops and he makes this statement, and he says, but just so you know, guys, as the Father knows how I live and the self-giving center of my being, I know him. And as I know him, he knows me. And I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep. Do you get it? He's saying, look, I know him and he knows me and we know where this is going. <laughs> and I will lay down my life for the sheep because 
that's the way I am, and he knows that. And he is going to be self-giving because I know him. Nobody else knows him. All right. In that little verse, we have just described the kingdom of nature. David's first half. First half. Now remember, once you get into David's life, after he comes into official glory, over and over again, when somebody challenges that in a certain way, he steps down. I mean, he, he could have fought back against Absalom. He could have, but instead he said, no, bless them. Lest if, God, if God wants to bring me back into that official glory, that's his business. But I readily, you know, my father knows me, and I lay down my life. Are, are you getting it? Are you following through on this? All right, so now turn with me to Matthew 22. And then after this, we'll get into some of the Old Testament scriptures about David so we can more clearly see this reality. <clears throat> Matthew 22, verse 41. <clears throat> nice little discourse here between Jesus and the Pharisees. Apparently, the Pharisees had gathered together. And in other books like Matthew or Luke or whatever, where they give this account, they make it clear that the Pharisees had been going after Jesus, trying to trip him up and get him. Verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. All right. This is, this is huge, though. This is huge. They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, how then doth David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies my, thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither dared any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. I'm going to start saying this kind of stuff to people so that from that day forth, nobody will... Never mind. <clears throat> this, is, this is interesting because no man knew the Father. No man knew what the nature of God was like. No, no man understood anything but official glory. Do you understand? The only kind of kingdom they understood was official glory. The greatness of your kingdom was based on how much and how far your official glory went. Am I right or wrong? That's just well, a well-known fact. But Jesus did come as the son of David because they did know David and they knew things about David and they were moved by David and, and they believed in certain things that David did that nobody else did. And so Jesus walked as the son of David. And as I said, I'll explain that even more. But he walked in this self-giving manner and he walked by this glory of nature to help people understand the kingdom. But at a certain juncture, Jesus says, well, we need to really put this thing in order. David is not the author of this nature. <laughs> sure, you saw it in him. Sure, you saw a man who didn't fight for official glory, who was happy just to live his life under the Lord in, in the self-giving manner, but he's not the father. And he's not the source. And that's when he says, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he really? And when they were calling, when the blind man, when the foreigner was calling, Thou son of David, what was the words that followed it? 
Have mercy on us because they believed that David and, this, and therefore his seed, his son. When we say his seed, we're saying, you know, um, my daughter sometimes you'll hear them say something. Somebody will, uh, like when we were in Arizona, somebody said while I was there visiting, uh, well, Cassie is, you know, she just tells jokes and is funny and da 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 and she's standing there and she said well I am my father's daughter and I've heard all three of them say that when somebody says something about them they'll go well I am my father's daughter well I have daughters if uh, you have sons and if they responded in that manner they would say well I am my father's son meaning that they get this from me The son of David, meaning not David is Jesus' direct father. Do you get it? But that I get this from him. He's like my father in the fact that I get this from him. This, this kingdom way. A different kingdom. A different kind of kingdom. I'm the son of David. But... In reality, David got it from me. <laughs> Whose son, you know, is Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. The Messiah is the son of David. And he saith unto him, how then doth David in the spirit? Call him Lord. Saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And there the Lord establishes that this kingdom and the glory of this kingdom that they saw in David and that, they, that gives them a bridge to comprehend what God is like came from God. And God is the source but this is the only place where he does that because he is not ashamed to be called the son of David. And when people called him that, that's when he responded. Okay? All right. Let's go to uh, 1 Samuel. And we'll be in 1 Samuel a lot to just look at several scriptures. Uh, chapter 16. Verse 12, this is speaking of Samuel sending for him, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance and handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came on David from that day onward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth him. Let our Lord now command thy servants who are before thee to seek out a man who is skill, a skillful player on the harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of his servants, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, and a mighty, valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, an agreeable person, and the Lord is with him. All right. So, God seems to confirm this thing and says, David, young David, you're the one. You're my king. And my spirit comes on you now. And even as it does, my spirit comes off of this guy who is not my king. Not only that, but an evil spirit comes upon him. 
All right, folks, in modern day Christianity, if we were involved in that little tete-a-tete right there, we would say, this is God proving that I'm the right one. And, you know, this evil spirit needs to torment them until they get out and step down from the throne because they're a usurper. I mean, that's the way we think, is it not? I mean, that's, that's how we, we go, well, this is God. God put that on them because they're not the right kind of king and they're not setting up the right kind of kingdom and they shouldn't be in office and this is wrong and bad leadership's terrible and it's really messing with me and my God. I mean, that's, isn't that, anybody, if you don't go through that or you haven't recently, have you heard anybody else? Yeah. People go, you know, ah, and, and so this is the Lord and, and so, and here's how we pray. Lord, get them, you know, get the, Make them so miserable until they realize their, the ignorance of their way and the folly of their way. Not David. David comes in and he is the king. That's the very guy that's king. You know, you know, when they come to you all the way to Bethlehem and you're out in the field again, you know, and they tap you on the shoulder and they say, hey, dude, we need you to come play. Because the king has got demon problems. And we need him, we need someone just to soothe him. David didn't say, well, soothing them demons ain't the answer. If he'd get right, come on, you know, I mean, this is the way we think. We're soothing, you know, you know why? Because we're of the wrong kingdom. Soothing him ain't the answer, man. He needs to get right. If he'll get right and he'll get in God's order and everything, I mean, God's made a declaration. I'm the king. He needs to move out. I need to go down there and he needs to say, you're the king and come forward. That's official glory right there, isn't it? David didn't go there for that reason. David went there to play and to minister to this guy that was demon-possessed that was taking his official glory. And being there for him and ministering to him. And interestingly enough, the only one on the planet that could minister to him. Because it was of the right spirit. You hear not one, not one word mentioned about I'm it. You know why? Because David wasn't of that kind of a kingdom. The kind of kingdom he was of said, if I can help this guy, whether it's a king that shouldn't be king or, or someone, you know, a blind man over here or a Gentile over there, I'm going to have mercy on them. Hello. And so he sits down and he plays with all his heart. And the spirit of the Lord is on him. And it's so refreshing to the king who, who the demons just seem to melt away in his presence. And he blesses the man who will end up being his enemy all the days of his life. And will hunt him like a dog in caves and in chasing him all over. You know. We would say, well, this is it, man. This is God. This is the very beginning. Kill him now. (laughs) Kill him now. We miss it. And we miss it over and over and over. Okay, let's let's go to um, 1 Samuel 26. And I already mentioned this example, but how powerful is this one. 1 Samuel 26 and verse uh, 8. And of course, I'm skipping a bunch. I'm not giving you the whole story, but I, I trust you either know the story or you have a Bible. And you can go back and read the story later. <clears throat> verse 8, chapter 26 of 1 Samuel. Then said Abishai to David, God had delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. And that, my friends, came out of someone who's supposedly of his kingdom. But you see, it's still early. And David is practicing. So he's not worried that everybody else don't have it yet. 
excuse my text, don't have it. Does not have it. God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him. I pray thee with the spear even to the earth at once. And I will not smite him the second time. Gosh, he's so impressive. He would be great in the boxing ring or wrestling match. Or, you know what I'm saying? Oh, man, this guy, I'll, I'll smite the dude once, you know. I, in my Oak Cliff days, in my BC days, there was a lot of gangs, a lot of fighting going on there. Somebody says, well, you know, you want to fight? Sure, we'll fight. So I'd tell them there are only going to be two hits in this fight. I'm going to hit you, and you're going to hit the ground. Very impressive. You say, yeah, but you've got to be able to follow up what you say. Not if you're of this kingdom. You don't say stuff like that. <laughs> Hello? And David said to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can, touch, who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David wanted to be right with God. It wasn't about official glory. It wasn't about how you were perceived by everybody else. To him, it was about how he was perceived by his father, by the Lord. That's all that really mattered. And that's all that, ha that, that must be the only thing that matters for you to function by the glory of nature. Because if anything else does, then you're probably functioning by official glory. <laughs> but if, that, but if, if you know that the glory the Father wants is the glory of this Son, the glory of His nature, the, the glory of the Lamb, the glory of God who is love, if you know that's what He wants, then you can live it all the time in any circumstance, everywhere, and bring glory to God even though no one knows it or gets it. They don't get it. They don't know it. They don't perceive it. It's, and let's face it, it's contrary to the natural man. I mean, I'm just, you know, I just had a flash of a bunch of songs in the old 90s, I think it was. Mighty warrior, dressed for battle. Anybody remember a period of time where all the songs were about battle and everything? Well, do you ever see Jesus? I mean, I know you read it in the book of Revelation, but do you ever see Jesus? Is that how he defeated the enemy? I thought they took him to a cross and hung him on. I thought that's where the victory, am I wrong or what? Am I just stupid? Am I stupid? Mighty warrior, like he's got this big so In fact, I remember CDs, worship cassettes, actually, with guys standing there with this shiny sword and this armor, you know, la, 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 instead of, you know, <laughs> la, hung there on a cross, bleeding and dying, and, you know, that's the cross is where he won the victory. Through death he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Well, Jesus, he defeated the enemy through death, through letting the enemy kill him. <laughs> you know, people think I'm crazy. I think they're crazy. <laughs> I mean, Paul said, God forbid that I glory in anything but the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ by whom I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. This guy can't get off the cross. He can't get away from that reality. He can't get away from the central focus of all things for him is Christ and him crucified. But we want to get, oh, I want to get past that so we get into the victory. What is the victory? Official glory. Our, well, that's what we call the victory, you understand. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. But if that's true, then why didn't the Vikings beat them? Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. 
All right, did I finish reading what I was reading? Uh, no, I don't think I did. Verse uh, 9 or 10. David said, furthermore, I like that. David says, destroy him not. David says, who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore. <laughs> Don't you love it? Don't you just love it? As the Lord lives, my God, this is about a living God. This, he didn't say as the Lord is God of the universe. He says as the Lord lives, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid something. The Lord forbid something. The Lord forbid. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that it is at his head and the cruise of water and let, let us go. Well, he, he stopped a major thing of official glory. He cut it off at the root. No, he didn't. He cut it off at the base and left the root. And then his conscience smote him later that he took that stuff. And he went, I can't even do that. Anybody ever thought that? My God, I can't even do this. I just I didn't do that. I just took his cruise of water. That's... It's nothing compared to what Abishai would do, much less if Saul found me in this situation. I can't even get away with the littlest thing because even the littlest thing that's not Christ is not Christ. That's, that's, that's the only way you can say it. Even the smallest thing that is not Christ is still not Christ. You say, well, there's this big thing that's not, well, anything that's not Christ. Can you, can you live that way? Can you set your heart that way? Can you say, I want Jesus supremely. I want Jesus, how about this, only. Because we're talking about your being now. We're not talking about how well you're doing in ministry. Because what? Because if you take this route, you're not going to be doing too good in ministry. <laughs> not as the world measures. Do you understand why? Because he's testing you because he wants to see where your heart lies. Jesus said it like this, very simple. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Well, I tell you what, that cuts it to the quick. And that will eventually, God will eventually put us through the paces until we realize where our treasure is. And frankly, our treasure is us. It is. Our treasure is us. I mean, you know, we might not stand in front of a mirror and go, I'm gorgeous. Oh, you know, something like that and get carried away in front of the mirror. We might even go like me or someone else. Can't stand to look. But wait till somebody puts you down or wait, wait till somebody starts stealing your reputation or taking away your official glory. Oh, my God. Then it's war. See, the other, we maintain that facade that the fact that I don't do that with the mirror says that I'm not in love with myself. But when someone starts taking away the things that's going to make you look bad to someone you love, that will make you look bad in the eyes of people you esteem, you will find out that you really love you and that you are hurt because of you, because of how you're appearing and how people are thinking of you. Okay. Well, but what if in all that you were following the Lord? Well, you probably were. You, you probably were walking down Calvary Road. But it's on Calvary Road, if you will. 
where you discover how much you love yourself. It's not on some foreign road. <laughs> you know, it's going down that road where all of a sudden you find out that we have this treasure in earthen vessels and the treasure is me. <laughs> I've seen the treasure and it's me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it's, it's devastating because you really do love the Lord. You really do. You do. But you never knew how deep pride was. Never knew. But how are you ever, how are you ever going to get anything uprooted, and we know the cross uprooted it, but how are you ever going to get it uprooted in the reality of manifestation unless it's all been brought out for what it is? Well, while, while it's all being brought out for you, everyone else is walking around smiling and smelling like a rose. You wouldn't be in that situation if you hadn't asked. You wouldn't. You wouldn't be in that situation. And the, here's the good news. At any time, you can quit the game. You can stop. You can get out. You can leave that road. You, can, you, don't, you don't have to go to the depths and, of your depravity and then come to such a place of corruption that your only hope is another life, and that's Jesus, and that you'd give all for that treasure. You'd go buy the field just to get the treasure that's in it. Anyway, we're not getting very far. <laughs> um, let's go over to 2 Samuel chapter 16. We were just in 1 Samuel 16, but let's go over to 2 Samuel 16. <clears throat> Second Samuel 16, and we'll start at verse 5. And when David came to Bahurim, behold, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was, Sh I always pronounce this Shemaiah. It's probably totally wrong, but most of you have heard me do it wrong so long that it's acceptable. Isn't that pitiful? <clears throat> whose name was Shemaiah, the son of, of Gera. He came forth and cursed continuously as he came. Now, your translation may not say continuously. But my living translation says continuously. Some of you got that. <laughs> what I'm living, it's continuously. <laughs> continuously, as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. Man, there's enough there to hack me off. Okay? I mean, even if I would be the lamb myself, don't treat God's people that way. Unless they're willing to become lambs too. And then I say, treat them that way. They need the exercise. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and at all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shemaiah when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou worthless fellow. Worthless. You know, he's, he is leaving, as it were, he is leaving the kingdom. He's leaving all official glory. And he's, he's going out in shame, and somebody called him worthless. Now, you're either going to get mad, and, when, you know, better, you know, the old saying, don't get mad, get even. That's, maybe that's an old cliff saying, but that's, you know, don't get mad, just get even. Or you're going to go into self-pity. 
That word worthless will beat you after, long after Shema is gone. And he continued to curse, saying, The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He never put his hand forth. There's no record. He didn't put his hand forth, and yet he's saying, and others believe just like he did, this has come upon you because of all of what you, all the bad stuff you did to Saul. <clears throat> In whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief because thou art a bloody man. Is it possible? How many of you think that, that King David was probably a pretty good man? How many of you think that he you know, probably was a pretty good king? How many would think that maybe he was the best king of all kings for Israel? Maybe. You know, other than Jesus, of course. I mean, you know. Well, not everybody thinks that. <laughs> not everybody thinks that. In fact, they not only don't think that, they think the worst possible things that you can imagine. I'm not talking about David now, and I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about are you, we talk about being a king's kid, which you've heard me talk on that. We're not a king's kid. The king is Jesus, and I'm not Jesus' kid. I'm the father's kid. So there is no, you know, all this stuff that we make up and say, and we all go, oh, well, I'm a king's kid. And we just run with it like, you know, it's just bait. Don't act. Oh, hooks us, and there we go. But we are priests and kings. We are supposed to live that way now. But what is the kingdom? See, that's the killer. Most Christians that say, well, we're priests and kings, official glory comes with all that. You know? I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about kingdom. I'm telling you that there, that, that there may be people who think well of you, but if they're not here yet, they will arrive in ships. <laughs> And will come against you because Jesus said it this simply to his disciples. I'm telling you, he's got them gathered around and he's about to go away. He's about to die. He's, I'm, I'm telling you these things so you don't forget it when the time comes. If, if they've hated me, they're going to hate you. If they've cast my name out, they're going to cast your name out as bad. That's just the way it is. Remember this when it comes so that, you know, you don't go into despair and all this kind of stuff. I guess I missed that little gathering. It took me a while to catch up. But I think I, I'm catching up. I'm not there yet, but I think I'm catching up. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> verse 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zuriah, unto the king. You know, this Abishai guy would be a good right-hand man, wouldn't he? I would just say this. Dude, I can't. I, I've got to go with the lamb. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, I need to stay. I need to stay with the Lord. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, officially, I don't have anything to say about. It. <clears throat> and so he said unto the king, "Why should this dead dog curse my lord?" <laughs> Don't you just love the word of God? I just think it's beautiful. Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Now, the first time he said that, he said it to Saul. But now it's years and years and years later. I mean, years and years later, he hadn't changed one bit. He didn't get it. <clears throat> Let me go over, I pray thee, and take his head off. And if you got anything, pangs of pain over loss of official glory, you'll say, you'll want to strike out somewhere. I can't do it there. You know, it's, it's the old saying, you know, why are you kicking your cat? 
come home from work, you kick the calf. Why did you kick the calf? Well, because somebody at work hacked you off, but you can't kick your boss. You following this? So you kicked your calf. See, so why, why do you keep kicking your calf? Well, because I can't kick my husband, so I kick the calf. Why? I can't even kick my kid, so I kick the calf. That's a real thing. If Christ didn't formed in you, I guarantee Shemaiah is David's cat. And this is it. It's just one guy. It's hot here. Nobody else is looking but my men. Dude, your head's going to roll right now. You talk about temptation. You know, here's the difference between, you know, us when we're tempted is we go, God, God, everything within me wants to kill him. I want to take his head off. You know, I just, you know, you start slowly pulling your sword out. I just, ah, no, Lord, I, I'm going to go with you. Whereas Jesus says, what brings glory to my Father is this nature in this way. When you go with this nature, it's like an airplane taking off. <laughs> it just goes higher and higher. <laughs> and higher! Until eventually, <laughs> shortly, I forget it. It ain't going to happen. The people listening to this or watching this probably can't hear that. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, yay, we reached the end. We went higher and higher. <clears throat> um, well, let me make sure I read David's response here. Um Verse 10, and the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zuriah? So, so let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, curse David. Who shall then say, why hast thou done so? David actually, I mean, get this. Try to work this into modern day Christianity. Mm -hmm. Try being a son of David. Today, David actually believed that maybe God stirred up this foul-mouthed, mean-spirited person to continually curse him. Well, you don't hear that in modern-day reality, and yet Jesus is called the son of David. And... He says, what have I to do with you? Your, your government is different than mine. <clears throat> Who shall then say, why hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son who came forth of my own body seeketh my life. Can it, can it get any more painful? How much more now may this Benjamite, Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. Notice he didn't say, and that the Lord will look on it and the Lord will smite him. He said, maybe God will see something in me and he'll go, you know, he'll bring forth good from this. Verse 13, and as David and his men went by the way, Shammai went along on the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went. And threw stones at him and cast dust. I mean, 
this dude was that close to losing his head. There's only one thing that kept him from not. There's only one thing that allowed him to continually be a cursor. You don't understand? That allowed him to continually be what he is that didn't just stop it instantly. Because we think stopping it instantly is the answer when the answer is to live Christ. To glorify the Father by through nature. Yes. Right. You know what I mean? That, that in and of itself is like a fleshly, hmm, I feel better about myself. Now I've given myself yes. some glory. That's right. Although, you know, technically I didn't really you know, right. do wrong to you. you know, I'm right. Like, that, it's like, even after the main trap of, of not doing that, it's like that's that last little trip up trap, you know, of the flesh trying to still get glory. Mm-hmm. That's right. The, this whole story here, really, it's got even another one that tripped him up and later he had to deal with on his way out of town. And I won't deal with Ziba right now, but it's just another one of them deals that when you're down and out, you're so susceptible. Um, and, and, and let me just say this, and you will flunk at times, many times. But there's, I know this is going to sound crazy, but there's almost like some virtue, not that it's virtuous, but there's almost some virtue in flunking because it's kind of like a driving test. If you flunk a driving test five times, somewhere along the line, you're going to know everything on the test. You know? And you might actually, what, what actually goes in your record on the test that you pass that gives you the, maybe a hundred. <laughs> Whereas some people get it the first time and they make a 76, but a 76 was passing. Yeah. Not to mention the people who took it the one time and maybe, let's say the people who took it the one time and made a 96 or something like that may have forgotten every, all of the most important rules that the person that failed so many times. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We only got a few minutes here and then they're going to cut me off. So. We do forget that. that. Now, this is a little off the subject, but I had, uh, I remember one guy was, this was a, a friend of mine who had just graduated from a school. He was, well, I won't say any more about him, but he had just become a doctor. He'd passed his stuff, but he was not very good. And he's just like, oh, God, I'm at the bottom of my class and everything. And I said, so, you, you know, is there somebody who's like number one who's going to be the big speaker at the graduation and stuff? And he said, yeah. I said, yeah. And he named his name, you know, so and so, so and so. I said, well, when he gets his practice and you get your practice and he hangs the plaque up in his office and you hang yours up, what's it going to say in front of his name? He said, doctor. And I said, what's it going to say in front of your name? Doctor. I said, does it make any difference? Do you have to be, you know, you are what you're supposed to be, now go do it. 
That's it. They've cut me off. Take a break and come back here in a moment. Oh. whole two semesters? Surely it is. <laughs> I started to say. You know, it's starting to feel like. 